Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with one co-host this week. I'm Joe Lalo. And Jeff is out of town this week, so it'll be the two of us, plus our cool guest, Adam Croft, coming to us from the UK. He has sold more than one million books to date. Uh, so he's one of the best-selling crime and thriller authors in the world. His 2015 worldwide best-selling psychological thriller, Her Last Tomorrow, became one of the biggest-selling books of the year, with over 150,000 copies sold in the first five months. And he's since uh, has since been in development for television. In February 2017, Only the Truth became a worldwide bestseller, reaching soar-wide number one at both Amazon US and Amazon UK, making it the best-selling book in the world at that moment in time. And uh, he's going to be talking to us today about advertising and some of the things he's done, uh, especially BookBub PPC ads, which isn't something we've covered very extensively on here before. So we're going to touch on that and maybe a little on Amazon and Facebook ads too, though we we have talked about those before. But uh, why don't I (laughs) let Adam talk a little bit? Why don't you tell us about yourself and kind of what your road has been like to being becoming a best-selling author? Well, the road's been fun and the road's been long. Um, I've been writing professionally for about um, about six years now. And my first book came out. It was meant to come out at the end of 2010. It actually ended up coming out the first few days of 2011 because I couldn't work out how to use KDP properly. Um, I, I mainly write crime thrillers. Um, I've got uh, two series that I write. One is um, a series of uh, police procedural crime books set here in England in a fictional town. Uh, The other one is a kind of quirky, humorous, tongue-in-cheek, golden age style mystery series, um, which is good fun to write. And I also write the the psychological thrillers. So I kind of got those three prongs, but they're all all crime related, really. Do you have any challenges uh, writing the story set in the UK? Uh, You you know, your bio says you were number one bestseller in the US, too. Are there any uh, challenges with getting stuffy American readers to uh, (laughs) accept the spelling (laughs) of color and... uh, some UKisms. It it does come up. It does come up, but um, you know my audience is mainly the UK, and I am from the UK. Um, you know, as much as I try, I can't. You know, write in in American, and as the books are set in the UK, it would be a, a bit bizarre having having UK uh, having US spellings and and you know USisms or Americanisms in there. It it would be a bit strange. So um, I'm I'm always wary of the American audience. Um, not wary in a bad way. I mean. I, you know, aware that that they're there and there are things that they might not get, and that I, I try to kind of address that if I can. Um, but yeah, the audience is is mainly UK, and the books are, are set in the UK. They are they are very British. Well, it's cool that you've managed to find an audience worldwide for them. Did you have a few books out before you kind of had some real success, or what did it look like? Uh, yeah, I was I was kind of covering the bills and um, filling in, doing a few other things as well. But when Her Last Tomorrow came out, that's when it really changed at the end of 2015. And that was my my ninth book was the um, the kind of the tipping point for me. So, yeah, it's um, and that was well, I'd, I'd been writing for well, nearly 10 years, actually. It was not nearly 10 years, nearly five years since I'd um, published the first book. Yeah. Yeah. End of 2010 and 2015. Yeah. Do you feel that that one just kind of hit the tropes, I guess, right, that people were expecting? Or is that when you started playing with Facebook ads? Um, A bit of both, really. Um, I would started playing with Facebook ads um, a few months earlier in the summer of 2015. And I'd tried advertising some of my backlist and I was getting some kind of good results, mixed results, I'd say is probably the best way of putting it. And I, I kind of started to realize the things that were important in having a successful Facebook advert and what was going to work. And I realized that kind of hooking people in and making them want to click through was the main thing, because at the end of the day, these people aren't on Facebook because they want to buy a book. They're on there because they want to look at cat videos or see what their friends have had for lunch. So I realized that I had to find some way of grabbing their interest. And that's when I thought of this, this book that I had actually written probably two thirds, three quarters of anyway, that I, I just couldn't finish. I couldn't find um, really where I was going with it. And it just sat in the drawer for a long time because everybody says to keep writing in a series and to, um, you know, all, all these old pieces of conventional wisdom, which I, I seem to somehow keep proving wrong. And uh, and that was one of them. And I, I thought, well, 
you know, I'll, I'll put it out and it will be an experiment to see if it works with, with Facebook ads. And, and it did, it had, it had a, a very marketable hook, which tied in very well with the ads and, and played on a lot of people's um, fears, I suppose, and, um, and enticed a lot of people to, to click through and generate a lot of interest. Yeah, I feel you're kind of famous now in the uh, podcast <laughs> sphere for self-publishing. It's always like that Adam Croft guy with his, uh, could you, is it, could you murder your wife to save your daughter? Is that That's it? That's the one. Yeah, worth the word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great hook. So I'm not surprised people keep bringing it up. Yeah. And um, how did you, I guess I remember your story, I think from Mark, Mark Dawson's podcast that you ended up just spending a whole bunch of money because you realized it was actually working and you were making sales on Amazon. Yeah. I was, I was, I was doubling my money most days. Um, and the days I wasn't, I was, I was tripling it. So I was, I was keen to spend as much as I could. People keep saying, I mean, at one point it was, um, sort of a thousand, fifteen hundred pounds a day, um, which is what's well, got to get on for $2,000 a day. So it, it wasn't that a, I started off doing that or be that I had that money because both of those are wrong. <laughs> I started off with a, a dollar or two a day, $5. And well, seeing that my money was getting doubled, I thought, well, if I'm doubling $5, oh, I want to be doubling $10 surely. So I'd, I'd up it. And as I was upping it, the conversions were going with it. Um, you know, it wasn't kind of plateauing. It, it just carried on doubling what it was doing. And it seemed to the book, and its hook at that time seemed to just hit something at the right point, I guess. Um, so I, I kept upping the budget and it got to the point where I'd just kind of run out of money, which is actually quite quick <laughs> because I didn't have any. <laughs> um, so then it was time to wheel out the credit cards and the overdraft and, uh, and ring up family and friends. And I guess that, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd been tracking things really, really closely. Um, and with Facebook ads, Facebook spends your money there and then that day and, and bills you for it pretty much straight away. Whereas with Amazon, as you know, the, the payments take two, three months, depending on what top, what, what point in the month the sales happen for you to get your money through. So there's that cash flow issue. And, you know, I could see the sales coming in, um, knew that money was going to come because it was coming from Amazon. Um, so it's just a cash flow issue really at that point. Um, it was, it was just kind of a victim of his own success almost. So it's a case of trying to get my hands on as much money from, from family and friends as I could to, uh, because I knew that I'd be doubling it two months later. Yeah. That's a tricky thing about the way this works is like, once you see the money has been earned, then you know that it's coming and it's kind of hard to, I'm sure it's kind of hard to uh, uh, express to someone, no, no, this isn't a gamble. The money is already there. I just won't get it for two months and I need to keep on paying it. It's not a Ponzi scheme. It sounds like it is, but I assure you this is happening. Yeah. There were a few raised eyebrows from people at the time, but um, you know, once I could you know, log in and show them the dashboard and, um, and all the spreadsheets and the calculations, I mean, I sat there for probably, two, three hours in the morning, just not only just checking the results and seeing what had happened the previous day, but double checking it and triple checking it and get my wife to come up and say, look, can you just make sure I've got these summed right? Because, you know, if not, I've probably lost us our house. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it, thankfully my maths was right and it's not often that happens. <laughs> uh, all right. So uh, for people who don't know, you mentioned earlier that you were disproving things like uh, writing in a series uh, is the way to go. Like, do you do write in series at all? Yeah, I have two series, um, which have been, I've been doing for the last, um, well, it's, it's actually seven years now, not six, as I said earlier, they're proving my point about the fact that I don't do numbers. Um, so yeah, I do. I write two series. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy them and really enjoy that character development and, and seeing where things are going. Um, but I'm not, um, not averse to doing something different now. I do write the psychological thrillers. I've had three of those out now and working on a fourth and they're all standalones. They're kind of connected through themes and, and what have you. They're similar styles of book, but they're, they're different characters and different settings every time. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there's value to both, obviously. A standalone doesn't have any sort of homework to do. You can just jump right into a new author with a standalone, so I can see the value there. Um, but it, like before the show, we were talking about how it all comes down to sell-through. So I can imagine that, like, particularly when you're looking at spending huge amounts of money on advertising, the relative earnability of a series is probably kind of hard to uh, uh, ignore. 
It is, yeah. And of course, every time I put a new book out in a series, um, the, the previous books in the series go up. Um, you know, they're people somehow, I don't know how, they've, they're on my mailing list and they've been there for years. But when book eight comes out, they, they suddenly realize I haven't read any of my other ones. I, I don't really know how, <laughs> how it works. But um, yeah, the sales of the others tend to go up. Um, and, you know, there's that kind of residual power as well. Every time I add a book to the series, the whole the whole series is lifted as a result. So when it comes for, to advertising a standalone book, it actually must be kind of nice because it's a little simpler on figuring out if you're breaking even or making money. Did you do like a four ninety nine book? I, I assume it wasn't a ninety nine center when you were. No, I think I think Facebook. when I started, it was two pounds ninety nine, three dollars ninety nine. I think, um, but I, I change pricing and, and play around with things all the time. Um, and yeah, it, it was different. Um, it is different to advertise a standalone book, and in some ways, it's easier because with a series or trying to sell a box set you're you're selling the characters and you're selling the kind of the overall package whereas with a standalone book it's kind of the situation or the the particular hook or that particular storyline rather than you know this the whole kind of you know have you met character x or you know this um they're, they're calling character y the the new jack reacher or or whatever um it's it is i guess in some ways easier to advertise a standalone yeah did you have to do any playing around in order to get, I, I'm sure you tinkered a little bit, to get the clicks down low enough that, you know, you were actually making enough sales. It sounds like you were kind of doubling your money. It, it seems like it's pretty challenging. I know I've played with Facebook and they want to give you like an 88 cent click if you're not paying attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that that particular ad, that particular book um, just, just did seem to work at, at that time. I'm not pretending it's through any kind of skill or judgment on my part. It was just pure luck, I suppose, that, um, y you know, you don't know what's going to work at, at what time or what's going to be hot at that point and, until it is. Um, you know, if we could predict it, then we'd all be doing it all the time. Um, but, yeah, you, you do have to keep a close eye on things. And, you know, I've had good success with, with other books on Facebook ads. Obviously, you know, nowhere near... Um, how well that one did um, and generally speaking I, I do have to put a lot more work and a lot more effort into keeping an eye on things and to uh, tweaking things as I go along because it it is a constant thing and it can eat up too much of your time if you're not careful and you know you, three months can pass and you've not actually written a word because you've been focusing so much on selling the backlist. Yeah, I think that's why I just don't have the patience for like one night I'll go in and tinker for an hour or two, but then like next day, got to write the next book. <laughs> Forget this yeah. stuff. Yeah. I just need a full-time marketing manager, I guess. Yeah, it is tricky. Um, and I guess the reason that I'm able to do it is because, you know, I do this full-time. Um, and not only that, but I, I work with my wife as well. She now, she's left her job and she's working with me doing the marketing and the advertising side of things. That does make things a hell of a lot easier. Um, and also I know that I'm very fortunate to be in that position and that most people can't and that most people in fact are kind of writing alongside a day job and I know how difficult that is because I've I've been there and, and done that for for many years so it's um I know it's it's easier said than done for, for sure definitely I'm still looking for a wife or husband I've, we've had a number of guests on the show that have said they've you know that that's happened where they've got their partner helping out there yeah it it has its downsides, but uh, yeah. But overall, it's it's quite a good thing. All right. Well, I'm curious. It seems like to get to number one in the entire Amazon store, that you would need to appeal to people who aren't just like fans of your specific genre. Do you think that's true? And was that something you were trying to do with your books, or they just happen to kind of grab many many <laughs> readers that aren't necessarily looking for crime thrillers? Yeah, it it is true. Um, with her last tomorrow, when that first came out, um, I did end up widening out the the audience quite a bit on my Facebook ads because I realised that 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 kind of hook, could you murder your wife to save your daughter, isn't something that's just going to um, appeal to to crime readers or to psychological thriller readers, and not just to readers. You know, anyone who's a who's a parent really or who has ever read a book is is probably going to have a you know a fair inkling that they they want to read that book and find out what's going on so the the hook helped i suppose in terms of reaching a, a wider audience um with only the truth the one that was uh, number one in us uk canada australia that um that was part of the kindle first deal that month because uh, that was a book that came out through thomas and mercer through amazon's imprint so 
being being part of Kindle first that month is it's going to get you in the top three, top five anyway. And it just just so happened that I was I was number one for a while. So um, yeah, I can't can't take too much credit for that one myself. Well, regardless of uh, of where the credit goes, you did get to the number one spot, which yeah. leads to my question. Uh, do you feel that having hit number one, having this sort of feather in your cap, has made it easier to sell books at all? Um, like, do, do readers and customers respond to the bestseller status? I don't know. I'm I'm not massively convinced they do. But then again, I never really put it on my my covers or anything like that. I, I do mention it on the the Amazon author bio and on my website um but i don't know I'm, I'm not i'm not entirely sure if it does i've been playing around with it in ad copy and and what have you um i mean i guess it probably is something i should should pick up a bit more but it i don't know jury jury still out on that one for me it's um i think nowadays i've got, got to be careful what i say here but i think um the word bestseller is bandied about a lot by indies um you know, and I think for me personally, bestseller is um, at at worst is number one in a, a main category. Um, you know, not kind of uh, vampire shapeshifters doesn't doesn't really count as a main category for me. Um, so you know, you, you do get people who would say it's a bestseller because it was you know it's number twelve in a, a sort of obscure subcategory, and yeah fair enough that's a that's a great achievement um but i think that does kind of overall does devalue the the kind of bestseller status i think um because you get to the point in there where you know a, a large percentage of books can be called bestseller yeah it's a tricky thing and it's like i have found and i don't have any statistics to back this up yet but it feels like you know bestseller or award winner or all of that are the sort of things that uh, we like to feel good about, certainly. Mm. Uh, but I've never bought a book because it said that the, it was number one bestseller. Mm. And more to the point, it really seems like that's sort of a um, like a resume item for if you wanted to become published later. And it's a weird situation where you had to have already been successful in order to succeed, which is the nature of publishing almost. Yeah, it is, and I guess that's why that's why people do it. Um, that's why people put the the bestseller tag there because, like you say, you, you need to have, have been successful in order to succeed, and that's that's the sort of sad nature of it. Um, I mean, I you know I, I I do it myself. I uh, mentioned in places that I'm twice USA Today bestseller. I think the two books that are on the USA Today list were number one hundred and fourteen and one hundred and twenty six or something. So. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they were there. They were on the list, technically. So yeah, I, you know, I'm a I'm a huge hypocrite, and I I do it myself. But um, I'm just not convinced it's um probably a good thing in the long term. Yeah, the the one place it may be helpful is if you're submitting for a book bob ad, and they've got the little comments section oh, yeah. at the end. And <laughs> I've heard people say, "Oh yeah, I'll mention yeah, New York Times, USA Today, got this award." <laughs> yeah, and and that that comment section is really really valuable. Um, I've noticed that since I started paying a lot more attention to that um, and getting, um, you know, a lot more kind of personal with the messages in terms of knowing that there's actually a person sitting there reading it and it's not just a kind of a sales pitch, but a, you know, a personal, you know, hey, this is what the book's done and this is what I think a book bub could do. Um, I've noticed that my acceptance rates have, have got a lot higher. Um, so, yeah, that's that's, yeah, probably pretty good advice, actually. Yeah, because we don't, they don't know necessarily. I mean, I think they've got some ways to look back at the price of the book has been and stuff like that, but they're not just going to know from your reviews necessarily that, you know, if you won awards or if you were a number one bestseller. No, no, it's, it's always worth mentioning. Um, and as well, I always mention if a book has been um, well received through BookBub uh, CPM ads, if it's done well there, I will always mention that, you know, BookBub's audience seems to be receptive to it and that it's you know, perhaps worth widening it out to a, a bigger audience through a featured deal. Uh, so, yeah, anything that is going to appeal to a BookBub editor, if you were a BookBub editor, what what would you be looking for? Um and now these guys, they're, they're thinking of their audience the whole time. It's all about quality control because if, if a, a bad book gets recommended to them, then to the readers by BookBub, then their reputation goes down. BookBub's reputation goes down in the eyes of their subscribers. People trust BookBub. There's a lot of books out there. There's a lot of free discounted books out there. But they trust BookBub to curate the very best ones. And that's why it's really difficult to, to get a featured deal because 
um, because everybody's after them because it's a, it's a real coveted thing to get. Definitely. And we're going to kind of segue into talking about the PPC ads, but I did have a question from the YouTube audience. Thank you guys for finding us at our <laughs> six hours earlier than usual today. So question from Luigi. What is the single one thing that you did that you knew it would lead to success or when did you know that you'd made it? Um, I, I never really know that something's going to be successful before I do it because in this industry, you never know what's going to work. Sometimes you think something's going to be big and it's just not or all the other way around. Um, but yeah, for me, knowing that it things had changed completely was kind of December 2015 when that book came out and started doing really, really well, really, really quickly. Um, I mean, within within a week, that book was making more in a day than any day job I'd had. So it was it was it was something that, that kind of cropped up really quickly and it as it carried on building and building, I thought, yeah, it's got to stop at some point. But either way, the number of books that are shifting and you know the place that my you know, I'm I'm seeing my name crop up here and there, it's obviously gonna have a, a good knock on effect in the future. Um and it's something that I can I can build on if I if I play my cards right with it. And that's what I've been trying to do since really. Yeah, when you said it was doing well, did you like rush to I don't know if you had a mailing list sign up in the back or not or you know like free book if you signed up to my mailing list now. Yeah, yeah, I've done all of that. I had um I think before the book came out I had fourteen hundred email subscribers on my mailing list and i've now um i've not checked today but i think it's due either today or tomorrow to hit twenty six thousand at the rate that it's going so yeah it's um yeah that and that's the main thing for me mailing list is is the main marketing tool because i i control that data to a large extent and i've got direct contact with my readers or at least twenty six thousand of them so that's that's kind of future proofing as well it's not putting all my eggs in Amazon's basket or or in anyone's basket really other than my own yeah it's almost good if success doesn't come too early before you really know what you're doing because you know it sounds like you're in the position to go oh yeah I need to get these people on my list and especially with a standalone where you might not be guaranteed that they're necessarily gonna go on to the next one if it's different characters and stuff yeah I mean if that had happened um five six years ago then I, I just wouldn't have known what, what to have done with it or where to have gone next um and and it, it kind of did to a certain extent the first book that came out um went on to a, a free promo um about three months after it came out and was store-wide free number one on amazon um and obviously that got a lot of people a load of reviews coming in not all good by a, by a long stretch um a lot of emails and what have you and i just didn't know how to deal with that i didn't have a mailing list at the time it just just wasn't really a thing this was april 2011 um and yeah that was something i didn't capitalize on and i literally spent the next four and a half five years uh thinking well obviously this is this is something that could work as a career if i can get a handle on it because i've had a little flavor of of what can happen when things kick off and i've spent the next four and a half five years learning what to do properly and how to actually manage it and make it a long-term thing awesome so well at some point it sounds like you started tinkering with bookbub ads and not just the facebook ones uh, i think everybody listening knows that bookbub is kind of like the sponsorship site that you really want to get it might be a few hundred dollars for an ad but you you know i almost everybody makes their money back and then some and then their ppc ads paper flick paper click <laughs> have been around for about a year year and a half now mm -hmm. did you get in right away what was your yeah yeah was, yeah pretty early actually yeah um i mean just a so small pickup there they're technically cpm ads you, you're paying for the impressions rather than the clicks um at the moment um but yeah i did i got in pretty much straight at the start um, and like most people i i played around and i set up a few things and thought yeah this is this is nice but it's not not really working as much the audience isn't as big as it is on facebook or or what have you and i just um i, I just kind of left it really and, and focused mainly on on facebook and on other forms of advertising but it's only fairly recently a few months back i'd logged in and i'd had a closer look and i noticed a few things had changed and i started to think a lot more carefully about what could be done i started to see a lot of potential in there and especially when i thought about 
what BookBub is, where those audiences come from as well that you're that you're advertising to, and um, as a result, started to develop a few strategies that I put together and started testing, and it 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 really started working. And there's a, there's a lot of potential there, and I've I've used a couple of guinea pigs as well, who have um, who have been doing some testing on that, and then have seen really good results too. So, um, yeah, I I thought about perhaps doing my own course or my own book or something like that because I've never I've never got into the kind of nonfiction side or doing courses or teaching other people about how to do things. Um, and but I thought actually this is this is something that's really got a lot of potential and something I'd, I'd like to share and i thought about doing my own course um but it it seemed to me logical that through mark dawson's ads for authors that it, it seemed to be logical to put it there because he's he's got that audience who are looking for uh doing online advertising for their books through uh, facebook ads through ams and it just it just fits in there really nicely so yeah i'm really pleased that it's um it's going to be part of that course very cool. And is that going to be, is he reopening it coming up this fall sometime with yeah, that new edition? Yeah, no November, I think. All right, cool. So can you give us a teaser on uh, some of the little strategies that you've played <laughs> with that have worked for you? Um, yeah, I mean, wh one thing I've been careful not to do in the, in the course is not to be too specific about you need to do this exact thing because something I've noticed a lot with um, Facebook ads, for example, is and and lots of other different forms of online advertising some quite specific advice about things that have worked for those people who, are, who have done the courses or are passing on the knowledge and as you know and as so many people watching this and listening to this will know all authors are different all readers are different all books are different and there are general principles that apply across the board or to again only to most people but specific advice will normally only apply to a certain percentage of people um, so I, I've kind of tried to address um, the principles and the background to the strategies that I've used so that people can kind of develop their own strategies from there rather than being too specific. Um, and of course, another uh, downside to, to doing that is that quite often when specific tips are put out, everybody does them. And as a result, they stop working because a lot of the things that do work work because they're unique or they're new or they're fresh and as as soon as somebody puts that out and everybody starts doing it it's it's no longer any of those things and it, it stops working all right well i tried them for the first time this summer after having been accepted to the beta right away and <laughs> not doing anything for a year but i was launching one of my pen name books and those are science fiction romance which they almost never pick up for the traditional sponsorship because it doesn't really fit tidily into any of their categories so i figured i'm never going to get an ad for this book anyway let's just try it as an additional tool to use at launch and i, I thought it worked pretty well i you know the first couple weeks i was able to get about four dollar or four percent cpm four dollars and that I don't remember what it was. <laughs> it was four, and it went down to two. Maybe that was the quick click-through ratio. Well, C CPM would be in dollars, and yeah, the click-through rate would be a percentage. Four, yeah, I think that's probably what it was. Because like they give you it all, right? They give you the yeah cost per thousand impressions and what you're paying per click, and it's actually nice because I it was very easy to notice because I did about six ads playing around that uh, if you were getting more clicks, you were paying a lot less for them, whereas yeah. they. Yeah, <laughs> if you yeah. otherwise it we went the other way around i heard somebody that had like a 0.1 percent uh click through ratio and they were paying like multiple over a dollar per each click yeah i mean the reason for that is you're you're paying for the impressions you're not you're not actually paying for the clicks it's charging you based on how many people see it so you could theoretically pay a load of money and have no clicks um the cost per click is a derivative uh, cost that is worked out based on um, what you've paid divided by how many clicks you've got. You, you can end up paying money and get no clicks, um, which is unlike Facebook. Well, Facebook does work like that unless you tell it you want to pay for the clicks. Um, on the BookBub front, um, can't say too much at the moment, but changes are afoot, I believe. And um, it, it's quite possible that something could change along those lines, but I, I can't say anything for definite. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've I've been having 
it, the success can vary on book bub ads. You can end up having very expensive clicks. It depends. The things that tend to mean it's very expensive is a you're targeting Amazon, probably in the US, that tends to be really expensive because everybody's doing it. Um, and targeting big name authors, that doesn't work as well on BookBub. What works well is um, is smaller name authors and specific types of smaller name authors. That's something I go, go into quite heavily in the course because it's thinking about how BookBub builds those audiences. And what is a big author on BookBub isn't necessarily what is a big author on, on Amazon or elsewhere. It takes a little bit more digging around to, to find out which, which keywords are going to work. Um, but yeah, so costs do vary. I've regularly had ads that are getting clicks for, for a cent or two. And those do tend to be on places like Kobo and on Apple um, and not always in, in US either. So it's a, it's something that works really, really well if you're an author that's wide and you're on all platforms. It does also work if you're in Kindle Unlimited um, because you do have the benefit of Kindle Unlimited. And if you can capitalize on that, um then obviously you've got those those page reads coming through and you're going to get paid for those but again it's a couple of months down the line sometimes before you see them because somebody's actually got to open that book and got to read it so you're not going to be able to track success on a day-to-day -day basis as you can if you're wide and you can see those sales coming through um, because book bubs reporting is is great you can it's pretty much live and of course the the dashboards you can um at apple or nook or, or wherever you can check pretty much instantly, if not within a day or so. Um, so it the strategies do vary depending on whether you're wide or not, but it is something that can work for everyone. Yeah, I've got to get my mind around that, that if you're paying for the thousand impressions, not the clicks. For some reason, I just want to make it like about the clicks, but <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And I, I did have that book in Kindle Unlimited, so I experimented with uh, half the ads were like 99 cents at wherever, and I did the different Amazon stores. But I also did free, free to read in Kindle Unlimited for some of them, and those had a slightly better response. So I mm -hmm. guess maybe a, a large portion of their readership is in Kindle Unlimited. Yeah, I mean, it, it again, if people who are looking for for free or discounted books, they're going to do well in in KU because they are to those readers essentially free books. Um, I mean, on the the CPM PPC thing as well, they are kind of technically the same. You one is not necessarily more expensive than the other the only downside to cpm really is that um you're going to pay whether people click on it or not um whereas if you're paying for the clicks you're not paying until the first person clicks but from that point onwards you're usually paying pretty much the same anyway um and again whether people click or not is largely down to is largely down to you it's down to how you're targeting down to the ad that you're putting out there um, whether people are being enticed so it's um it's certainly not a downside and i think the fact that it is a cpm model not a ppc one does put people off which means that it's um it's more more fertile land to plow now, obviously, uh, you know, the goal of any advertising is to get people to click uh, or well, to get people to buy. But uh, like and, and often the only information you really have is whether or not they clicked. So like what would you say, like how, how do you craft an ad that not only gets people to click, but actually gets people to buy? Because it seems like people who are only targeted on clicks have run the risk of putting together basically clickbait that will lower their, uh, you know, uh, favorability with the audience, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, obviously you want to be careful to only target people who are going to be wanting to read the book anyway. Um, it's not, I mean, it kind of is about getting as many people to click as possible, but it's about getting as many potentially interested readers to click as possible. So it's not just, you know, kind of farming the clicks. Um, but you know, there, are, there are a number of ways to do that. And the, the main thing really is to just take this holistic approach of making sure that that book appeals to those people and uh and setting that in the right way yeah i think that that's the thing that uh, a lot of people who are like new to advertising uh don't realize immediately is that it is the targeting like lots of people think i just want this this uh, ad to be in front of as many people as possible but it's more down to putting it in front of as many people who are interested in it as possible and that is almost entirely in your hands since you're choosing who it goes in front of yeah i mean i, I would far rather put my book uh, in front of a hundred people who I know are very likely to want to read it than in front of 10,000 people who I, I don't know anything about. 
because a the success rate is likely to be higher with the first crowd and b it's going to be a lot cheaper as well um it's it's kind of the equivalent to just putting a, a the, the 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 one that i always use is putting a, a a poster in a train station about a book and saying you know how good it is we see them all the time the traditional publishers do it all the time and very few people who see those posters are a you're going to be readers b you're going to read that type of book or c you remember what the bloody hell it's called by the time they get to the bookshop anyway so it's yeah being specific with your targeting is really important and that's that's probably the main uh takeaway that i've had um from the the amount of time and money that i've spent on, on online advertising over the last couple of years it is knowing your audience and finding them one of the nice things about the book bob as you were talking about is you can not only pick categories to target you can put in like your list of authors that you want to do and uh, unlike on facebook they don't have to be big authors with like tens of thousands of followers in order to be targetable uh, when i did it i tried it both ways the categories and then the authors for different ads i just went into the top 100 on amazon for my little category and, and basically went through you know surf through people's also bots and everything and found all the authors i could selling similar books and almost all of them i think they might have to have a book bub profile in order to be targetable, almost all of them did. Uh, did you play, like, what do you like best or do you do a mix of both? Um, always targeting authors, especially if I'm looking at actually selling books rather than just getting visibility. I do do some targeting of genres, but that is for building buzz or, or visibility or for um, for branding really, rather than direct sales. So yeah, always authors and never usually the big names either. Um, big name authors, um, don't usually have a big profile on bookbub especially if they're with a big publisher um reason for that is bookbub audiences for cpm ads are built in three ways either people who have clicked on that author's featured deal at some point people who have clicked on that author's bookbub cpm ads at some point or who have gone onto bookbub found that author's profile and clicked the follow button um all of those things tell bookbub that you're showing an interest in that author's books and it throws you in that audience um the Big name authors with big publishers don't tend to have featured deals, don't tend to run BookBub CPM ads. Their publishers are perhaps from a far more traditional mindset and they are putting the posters up in the railway stations. Um, so the only time those people are going to get a BookBub audience is if somebody has gone on, they're a BookBub member already, they've gone onto that author's profile and they've clicked follow, um, which has its benefits. You know, they get new release alerts and, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, but generally speaking those those audiences a are often aren't even big enough there are some big name authors who just don't have a big enough audience to even run an ad to and they just don't respond as well because one of the best things about bookbub's audience is how responsive they are to people like us to people they've not heard of um i can't remember the exact numbers now i put it in the course but something like 75 percent, i think it was of bookbub subscribers will um no sorry 95 percent of bookbub subscribers will um read a book or buy a book from bookbub from an author they've never heard of if they like the sound of the book and a lot of the people who read traditional authors perhaps aren't quite as adventurous so yeah for me it's definitely about targeting the smaller authors but the ones who have got a bookbub presence so the people who have run a featured deal in the past the people who you see running cpm ads these are the guys who are building a good responsive bookbub audience so not only do you know that because they're regularly knocking about in bookbub that they're, they've got a good audience but you know that the people who are in that audience have got there because they've clicked on an ad or they've clicked on a link in a bookbub email so these people click these people, if they see a book they like, they go through. So you know that these are the most most fertile audiences to go for. Yeah, I actually found that uh, even though my pen name has only had like two book bubs and three years of trying, because I, like I said, I think that category is just not a really good fit for them. Mm. A lot of the authors were on there. Maybe they were like me and it had one or two over the years or they'd tried the ads and it did turn out to be quite effective, which I was pleased mm. <laughs> since uh, the pen name has not otherwise had luck with book bub. Yeah, uh, I mean, do you, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was going to say it again. It's one of those things that it's 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 a general principle. There are things that don't always work for for everyone. I mean, not, this is one thing I've I've learned over the years is that there is nothing that is true for everyone. Um, 
you know, we, we all know the, the general rules about getting a, a cover professionally designed and we've all seen really, really bad covers hit the top of the charts. Um, you know, there, there are all of these old adages aren't, aren't true all the time, but they're, they're things kind of generally they're stuck to as a starting point. But, you know, if you can, if you can go your own way with it and make it work even better, then, then great. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see as an author, how many people are targeting you because under my regular name, I've had like 30 book bubs over the years. So I had to yeah. have a pretty good, uh, be in this ad somewhere. Generally speaking, if you're advertising your own books, you are your best keyword. If, if you are, um, a book bub keyword with a big enough audience, then it sounds bizarre because you think, well, surely these people have already read all my books, but as I was saying earlier, every time I advertise a new book to my existing mailing list, it's amazing how many people have not read them or have somehow never even heard of the series. I mean, God knows what they're doing on my mailing list. <laughs> but um, it's, it, it's it's always worth targeting yourself and seeing if you've got a good book bub name. It's, it's amazing what can work, especially with a new release, of course, because those guys definitely won't have it. Yeah, actually, let me pass you to Joe because I think he did that once. So, Joe, didn't you target yourself with some book bub ads? Uh, yeah, I did. That was when I was, uh, I released, I want to say between it was outside any of my other, uh, series. And I knew that people who liked my science fiction and people like my fantasy would have a shot at liking it. But I was pretty sure that because it wasn't in either of the series that they would have followed, they would have known about it. So I've only run two book bub ads and one of them was targeting me and it got a couple of sales. It wasn't, it wasn't like a turnaround, make it a bestseller, but I think it probably revealed it to a few more people than it would have otherwise. Yeah. I mean, this is what book bub ads is good for. It's good for, it's kind of like AMS in the, in terms of the fact that it's, it's not going to blow your career open overnight, like in the same way that, that Facebook perhaps can. Um, but but it is good for uh, sorry my sound cut out of your end it keeps cutting out of my ears there i'm just double checking it is we getting still through. hear you okay yeah, yep cool. <laughs> okay. no worries um but it, it's not going to to blow your your career open overnight but it is good for for steady sales and for steady profit and you know these are sales that you weren't going to get otherwise and it's you know if it's a dollar spent and a dollar 50 or two dollars made back then then why would you not do it I did find that by doing a new release, it was a little hard to tell how many of those clicks were leading to my sales because I was also doing sponsorships on the newsletters at the same time. And uh, the book was sticking pretty well in its little category. So I don't know how many were just organic. Is there any way to measure or I think I feel like they just want straight Amazon links or they do, but they're editable. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are editable. So you can put affiliate links in. You can put affiliate codes in. Yeah. I did not and, know that. I'm going to have to try again. <laughs> and they, they do track through. I, I've i tested it and used it on um, both uh, on Amazon links and on iTunes. Um, I'm pretty sure you could probably do it with Kobo as well, because the only thing stopping it would be at BookBub's end. And if Amazon and iTunes works, there's no reason why they would have stopped it happening for Kobo. Um, the only reason I don't use it for Kobo is because I can't, for the life of me, work out how to use their affiliate program. We'll have to get Mark back on the show one day and uh, ask him if there's any secrets there. I haven't even tried to sign up for theirs. No, that that's painful enough as it is, that bit. Do you find that, do, do you just keep them running continuously? Because I found that I had the most success in the first two weeks and then, you know, things kind of slowed down after that. I assume they started showing the ads to the same audience again, you know, especially if you're in a small little niche like that. Well, yeah, the reason is they they actually stop showing the ads to people after a certain number of times. Um, so the benefit of that is that if you do go on holiday and forget you've got BookBub ads running, it's it's not going to just run away with itself and suddenly start showing to the same people over and over again who are going to get annoyed. Um, and that, you know, the cost per click isn't going to suddenly fly up like it does on, on Facebook once you've tired your audience out. Once the audience is tired out, um, BookBub knows it. There is a set number of times it shows that ad to each user in a new email before it then stops showing it to them. So that's why the ads will slow down because they're not actually being shown as much anymore. Um, you will still see new impressions coming through because new people are joining BookBub all the time. New people are clicking on that particular author's link. And you might find it, you, you can pause and archive ads if you've, if you've had enough of them, but you might find as well that, say, you're not getting many impressions at all because the audience has has, has expired um if that author then gets 
a new BookBub featured deal or something a couple of weeks down the line, there's suddenly a whole new load of people in that audience and it can, it can revive the ad. Um, but you can leave dead ads for want of a better word there, because they're, they're not just going to carry on showing and, and costing you money. Yeah, I know uh, when we had our uh, had Facebook experts on, they talked about um, one of the Facebook tells you how often a given person who clicks has seen the ad, and like you can, it's sort of up to you to moderate how often you think so many people should be seeing the ad. So it's almost nice that that uh, Bookbub would take care of that for you. Yeah, it is, um, and you know, I I trust them to know what the right number is. Um, I mean, I they they test things all the time and it is a, it's a specific number that applies to all lads and to all people um but they would have tested that to know the reason they use that number but bub tests everything in all of the emails that they send out um daily the, the featured deals um the description that you see for a book and the description that i see for a book might be different they split test them they send out two three sometimes four different versions of a description um in order to test what words work best they are heavily <clears throat> heavily data driven and you know i kind of trust the conclusions that they come to oh yeah i mean it's their jobs um all right so let's say that you're on a limited uh, ad budget do you think that it's best to have ads bunched up around the launch to really pu push your launch or would you say that just having sort of maintenance ads running all the time has a better uh, return on investment well i i kind of do a bit of both um but i think if you're if you're on a limited budget and you've got to choose to do one, it probably makes sense to do it around the launch. Um, if only for the possibility that the, the kind of the spike, especially if you're doing other things as well around the launch, if you're doing mailing lists, if you're doing, um, I don't know, any kind of blog tours or any social media stuff, that that kind of spike could lead to some kind of organic carrying on of that success, if you see what I mean. Um, so I think if you had to choose, I'd probably say use it for a launch, but if you can, then then do both because there are specific strategies that work for a launch and there are specific strategies that work for advertising your backlist and for keeping that moving on as well. Do you worry at all when you, when you try the ads that if you then later get a spot, you know, one of the regular sponsorship posts that people will have already seen that book and, and be less interested, or is that, do you feel like the audience is big enough that it's just not going to matter that much? Um, it doesn't really concern me because even a really, really, really good click through rate is, is 5% on a BookBub uh, CPM ad. So if you, if you get anywhere near that, you're probably making very decent returns. Um, so that means that 95% of people didn't click it. So that 95% that of people, they're the people I'm trying to get next time around with the featured deal. Perhaps people don't click the ads. Perhaps they just don't realize what they are. Perhaps they've got an ad blocker in their, in their browser. And um, there could be all sorts of reasons why people don't click on them. Um, but if that 95% haven't clicked through, uh, it's not me thinking, oh, well, maybe they're not interested because they are interested in those types of books. They are subscribed to um, to the crime fiction category or to the you know, the, the cozy mystery category or, or whatever it is uh, for the particular book that I'm, I'm advertising. They, I know that they like similar types of books and similar types of authors. That's why I'm targeting them. That's why they're seeing the ad. So yeah, I don't I don't really worry because the the click through rates, even a really good click through rate, is actually relatively low. Do you find in United? I know you said you didn't want to get into too many specifics about how to compose an ad. I, I think I had read through a forum with some examples, and the ones that were doing best were like images, not not a book necessarily. Um, are there any general tips you would give for people that are trying to save themselves a little and <laughs> not waste money? <laughs> Um, there are, I mean, there, there are kind of general principles that apply to, to advertising in general as, you know, have a, a strong call to action, um, generally testing again, different things do work for different people. Certain colors do tend to work better on the buttons. Um, from the testing that I've done and from the other people have done yellow buttons for some reason tend to work quite well. Um, and the thing with a book bub ad is you've, you've got a very small, um, area really a tiny little almost a square to 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 get all your information across if you've got an image of any sort then you've taken up most of the space already so getting across to people that it's a book that they might like that it's in their genre 
uh, perhaps getting across some kind of marketable hook, um, the price and a call to action, all those things are really, really difficult to squeeze in. Um, but they're, they're kind of all things that need to be there. And there are ways of of combining those elements together as well, quite skillfully. Um, but yeah, it's it, they're, they're all things that, that need to be in there or to get as many of them in there as you can, really. Yeah, that's why uh, you probably do even more. I think I tried six different variations of it for my first one to see which had the most responses. And, you know, I think the one that was like read free and KU did really well, but the 99 cent one did well too. And then a couple of them I put like a five stars from a customer review that said something like it's a geeky, you know, something for geeks, which was, which is kind of my core audience. And so that one did quite well. Like I figure only the people that were like geeks, that's me <laughs> picked yeah. it, but that's who I want. So yeah, I mean, I mean, one that did well for me was um, quoting an Amazon review that someone had left. I can't remember the exact wording, but literally one sentence of their review um, made the book sound a really good B made it really clear what genre it was and what type of book and C um, just made people want to kind of read on. So I, I used that as the, the text of the ad um, because that they'd somehow managed to just write great copy for me in their, in their Amazon review. And they've got all of those things in there. Um, and that, that really made me think about it as well, about how you can kind of skillfully craft a sentence or two sentences to get all of that information across without sounding too spammy and salesy. It's rather than trying to sell the book, you're, you're trying to sell the idea. It's that whole, it's that old sort of marketing advice that's that's always given but it, it's really true it's you're not saying to people buy this book um you know the, the strong call to action isn't buy now or get this book it's 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 something that makes people aware that they need to take an action if they if they like the idea that's being sold to them all right well uh joe do you have any more book bub questions i have a couple twitter questions on more general stuff but uh if you want to wrap up this section here um just i get one more question and that is uh you've talked about how there's different um tactics for doing a a, a launch like advertising a launch versus doing maintenance advertising and you also talked about toying with advertising your backlist is there anything specific to advertising a backlist that this that's different from the other two ways generally speaking tighter targeting um when you're advertising a new release, you're, a good way of starting it off is to advertise a little bit wider, so perhaps go into targeting the genres. Um, if you're advertising that something is either coming up soon or available for pre-order, uh, well, for BookBub, you need to say it's available for pre-order because there have to be links that they can go through to. Um, but I'll generally start a bit wider and, and move in narrow when I'm trying to get people to take a specific action to buy a book that's live. So, yeah, for, for, for advertising to a backlist, it's it's definitely tied to targeting. You're not saying this book is new. You're not saying it's on a special pre-order price. You're and a lot of the time you'll be trying to get people to invest in a series. If you're you know, advertising book five or book six in a series or a box set, um, you know, you're asking more of people. So I guess that would be the main thing is to say, to get the targeting much tighter. All right, good to know. I've got to play around a little bit with the, the backlist stuff instead of just the new releases. Um, I guess, Jared, this is kind of a, a book bub ad. Can you see a positive ROI on PPC ads for a 99 cent ebook, or do your bids need to be so low that you sacrifice visibility? Can I? No. Um, can other people? It has been done. Um, I've, I've never got anywhere close, frankly. Um, but. Again, there are, there are a couple of ways of thinking about this. Um, <clears throat> you know, losing money on a book on an ad isn't a isn't necessarily a bad thing, and b isn't necessarily actually losing money. Um, I know that Mark's been doing quite a lot of research into sell through, and he's got statisticians working on it at the moment as well, <laughs> um, into calculating. You know, if somebody buys either free or discounted book one, how likely are they to read through, and and therefore what is that one reader of that free book actually worth? They, they could be worth five, ten dollars in the long run. So there's that way of thinking about it as well. Of course, that is is a gamble because you don't really know what that figure is. You don't know whether those people are going to go through and buy the books. It depends on so many things as well. Um, you know, the answer that Mark or Mark's statistician comes up with is not going to apply to everybody because 
Mark might have a higher read through rate because his books are better than mine or because uh, readers of action thrillers tend to stick to a series more or you know because his his pricing is is better or or, or whatever or his, his blurbs are better um so again it's it's a known unknown the the read through side of things um but it is there we know that you know a certain number of people who buy um one free or discounted book will go on to buy other books in the series um i, th I think in terms of bookbub readers something like 63 percent i think it was of people who read a book uh, that they've got through bookbub will go and buy other books from that author so advertising a 99 cent book can make you a profit in the long run but it's likely to a be unpredictable um and b take months before you'll find out um and there's obviously not too many people who can put the budget into to finding out and to just say hey let's give this a go but fortunately for us mark's one of them so yeah he's taking one for the team all right cool yeah i think i would wait until i had like all you know like six or eight books out in the series before i threw a lot of money at just yeah doing yeah. that 99 cent book one no let, let, let mark waste his money first and uh, we'll see if it <laughs> works afterwards all right uh jimmy from the chat asks did you make any marketing mistakes or is there anything you would avoid in the future Oh god, yeah. That, that's why it took me. That's why it took me five, six years to uh, to have any kind of real success. So, yeah, that I mean, marketing is is probably ninety percent mistakes or or learning what's what's gone wrong. Um, it's you know, you're constantly testing, and every time you find something that does work, a few weeks later it stops working. That's kind of the the frustration and the addiction of it, I guess. Um, I mean, specifics. I can't think of anything that necessarily springs to mind at the moment um mainly because nothing's been massively catastrophic because i tend to test at lower budget levels which is something i'd always always suggest doing i don't go in at kind of 50 dollars a day and say i hope this works because if it doesn't then it's goodbye 50 dollars um so yeah I've, I've made mistakes all the time and and still do daily yeah, maybe we should say that BookBub is one of those places where you can go through a lot of money really fast if, <laughs> if you've got a pretty big audience targeted, I guess. I, I found it really easy to spend money. And that's, that, again, that's why I don't go for big name authors because you, you can get a lot of wastage and it is more likely to waste your money as well because they're they're less likely to convert as well as, as smaller indie authors with a you know, with a, a decent BookBub audience, perhaps not as big of one, but one that that reacts better and is more likely to click through and more likely to buy that book. All right. Well, I think that wraps things up for me. Joe, do you have any final questions you want to ask before we let Adam go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just one question about mailing lists. Like you said, even though, you know, we, we had you on talking about advertising, you said that your mailing list is sort of your main uh, mm. marketing tactic. Uh, how often do you contact your mailing list and what sort of things do you put in your emails? usually every week sometimes every two weeks um i was really really hesitant at first and i used to an email people every couple of months and then managed to do it once a month through gritted teeth because i i really didn't want to go bugging people um but a couple of people suggested to me that you can you can get away with doing it um a lot more frequently than that so i now do it once every week or, or two weeks kind of whenever i've got something to say but if i'm getting towards a week half and i haven't said something I'll, I'll find something to say and the thing that i have learned is that you've always got something to say um, i i survey my readers every year um, i did it most recently in may and i'd already started sending emails weekly by then and um one of the questions i asked was is the frequency of my emails too much too little or just about right and 98.3 percent, i think it was said it's just about right so that's that that's I'm, I'm happy with that um and i also asked them what they like hearing about from me and i gave them the options of you know what 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 benefit do you get from being in the vip club which is what i call my mailing list and i gave them the option of getting free books you know winning stuff in competitions finding out more about me hearing about new releases and i think the other one was getting early access to new releases and the ones that came out on top were finding out about new releases and hearing about me and the ones that came out bottom were getting free books and competitions and all the things that I thought people were probably there for. Um, and that was borne out um, 
in in february when my my son was born i emailed my list and let them know and sent a little picture and you know all the rest of it and i got i think it was one and a half thousand email responses within 48 hours um with people you know wishing me good luck and all the rest of it um and that was the first point that i wished i didn't have a policy of replying to every email i receive um because it took me the next week week and a half to actually reply to them all um but I think that just kind of shows what people want from a mailing list. And they do want a personal connection with the author. They do want to find out more about you. So, you know, even just if you've been on holiday recently, just letting them know about that. If you can tie it into your books, then great. Um, there's a couple of times recently where things have popped up in the news, which have been relevant to books that I've written in the past. Um, uh, there's one about um, recently about how in the UK, um, there are groups of vigilantes who are kind of luring child sex offenders online and posing as young girls in order to, to sort of flush them out. And then they're reporting them to the police. And it was kind of around, is this all ethical? And I'd written a book on that very subject um, three, two, two years ago now, two and a bit years ago. And I linked to the article and kind of, you know, tried to generate a bit of discussion and mention the fact that it had been addressed in that book. and sent that email out and that book sold an extra couple of hundred copies that day just from just from sending that email out so it's if again if something crops up in the news that you can um that you can address and, and link to one of your books that's a good way of doing it as well but you know just talking about yourself is is great and i have links to my books in all of my emails and even if it's not an email that is advertising a book I, my sales always go up on the day that I send an email out. And I've, I've tested that by changing the days of the week um, left, right and center. And it always seems to spike sales because it, it reminds people that you exist. Yeah, it's something I should do more of too, because we always get in the habit of thinking, well, we can only promote our new release to our mailing list. But I've had the same experience where, you know, like an audio book is coming out of the old book or something. So it gives me a reason to bring it up and, you know, and you'll sell a whole bunch of copies to people you just thought knew about all your stuff already and they had it. Yeah. If, <laughs> if they wanted yeah. it, they've got it. But that's not necessarily true. No. And I would say to anyone watching this and listening to this, if you don't already email your list once a fortnight at least, then, then do that. Do it once a fortnight. Not necessarily on the same time every day. So they know that you know every 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning and they're going to get an email from you. Um, vary the days so that you can go in and see for yourself that on those days your sales spike as long as there are links to your books in there somewhere and I have them in the footer I just say you know PS here's a link to here are links to all of my books in case you've not read any um, and you know it works it really starts to build up a brand as well and people have a connection with you so that when you do come to say hey, I've got a new book out they've they've got a bit more of a connection with you it's not you're not just emailing them um, to sell them something. And that's actually what people don't like. If you only email them every six months to to sell them something, you kind of come across like that that cousin who you only speak to once a year when he rings up because he's short of money. It's, you know, you kind of, you come across a bit like that. Whereas if you pick up the phone and speak to them each week or or however and actually show a genuine interest in them, then you're, you're going to get a lot more from them in the long term. Yeah, it sounds like a great philosophy and something we should all keep in mind when we're because a lot of people go, what should I email about, you know, or <laughs> what should I blog about? And uh, so it's often a question we hear from authors. Yeah, just have a chat. I mean, I, I know an author who's traditionally published and it does very well. And he most of the time just sends out pictures of his cats. <laughs> and that seems to go down well. So, um, you know, find something and then make it yours. Yes. A, a dog laying on a book, one of your books. There you go. That works. That works. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, remind everyone where they can find you online. And if you have a new release or a book one they should start with, let us know. Yeah, my, my website is adamcroft.net. You can get a couple of free books from there. See, mailing list. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Adam Croft. Um, and I'm on Facebook as well. You can just search for my name. We've got an author profile there, which is forward slash Adam Croft books. Um, yeah, the free book. Um, first book in each series is, is free on, on Amazon and all other good retailers permanently. All right. Sounds good. And I'll put all your links in the show notes for episode 151. 
That's at marketingsff.com, guys. Come on by if you want to comment or just get those links. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Adam. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening, uh -huh. everyone. Bye-bye.